After traveling around Japan for years and meeting with people who have dedicated their lives to producing and preparing the best teas in the world, we've learned a few secrets along the way. In this video, we will be sharing our travels around Japan as we search for Japanese green teas produced without pesticides or chemicals. To begin our journey, we start in the city of Tokyo to get a short introduction of some of the common types of Japanese green teas. Hidden behind the noise and lights of Tokyo lies an impressive tea culture. Many of the people that walk these bustling streets have replaced green tea with coffee, but if you look hard enough, you can find oases of premium loose leaf green tea. We're going to visit a few different tea shops in the area and get a hands-on experience with some of the most popular types of tea in Japan. Back in the early 18th century, when Tokyo was still known as Edo, a new type of tea began to take the city by storm. It was brought over here by Nagatani Soen, a farmer and tea merchant from Ujitowara. He met with a local tea merchant from Nihonbashi named Yamamoto Kahe, who put his new invention on the map. At the time, most tea was ground and mixed into water, but this new type of tea was steamed and rolled to lock in the flavor. The leaves could then be infused into water to release their flavor in a smooth and fragrant tea. This tea became known as Sencha, and it soon overtook matcha as the most popular type of tea in Japan, all because its initial success in the markets of what is now Tokyo. With more than 38 million people, Greater Tokyo is now the largest metropolitan area in the world. In fact, it's so large that it has to be split up into 23 different wards, all of which can be easily navigated from the excellent subway system. To start off our tea journey, we're going to Minato to visit our favorite tea shop in all of Tokyo. This is Sakurai, a tea house that does a great job of blending the modern and traditional traditional elements of Japanese green tea. First, you get to pick out the types of teas you would like to try from a list of options, and then the tea master prepares them in front of you. To begin the tasting today, we will start off with Gyokuro, a very unique tea that expresses the typical savory or umami flavors the Japanese teas have become famous for. This tea has to be brewed a very particular way, with a small amount of water at a very low temperature. Because this tea shop uses a traditional iron pot to heat up their tea water, she will need to use a special technique to cool the water down. When you pour boiling water into a ceramic cup without preheating it, it will bring the temperature down quite quickly. If you then transfer that water into another cup, it will bring the temperature down even further. The tea master repeats this four times to bring the water temperature down from 100 degrees Celsius to 60 degrees Celsius. She says that each time you transfer the water, it lowers the temperature by 10 degrees Celsius. This is definitely a helpful trick to keep in mind, especially when you're preparing Japanese green teas, as they are extremely sensitive to temperature. Once she has the right temperature and the leaves are measured out into a shibori dash, or flat teapot, she will drizzle about 50 milliliters of water on top of the leaves and let them brew for two minutes. By using a tiny amount of water like this, she is able to concentrate the gyokuro, giving the tea a thicker texture and a more powerful taste. The end result is a tiny serving of some of the best green tea you will ever have. After the hot tea was finished, the tea master began to prepare a cold brewed tea from the leaves. She takes out a block of ice and begins to break it up with an ice pick. She then puts the crushed ice into a pitcher, adds in a pickled cherry blossom leaf, and then pours out some of the tea. After mixing this all up, it's ready to be poured into a glass to create the perfect cold brewed tea. While we normally think of tea Tea as a hot beverage, it can work great when prepared cold. The flavor of cold brew tea can even become smoother and sweeter than hot tea. This is because the bitter components in the tea, the catechins, are extracted at hotter temperatures. When you brew the tea too hot or for too long, you will begin to extract some of these catechins and they will soon begin to bring more bitterness to your tea. A well-made cold brew tea like this one can make for a smooth and refreshing beverage, particularly on a warm day. From Fukuoka, Tsuyuhikari, it's bitter and little green tea umami. Uh -huh. mm. From Kyoto, Yabukita, fresh mm -hmm. and little sweet. Mm -hmm. The next course of the tasting is hojicha. The tea master lays out six different types of teas to choose from and then roasts one of them by hand in a special type of pan. As the leaves are roasted, the flavor is changed completely. It trades these fresher notes of steamed vegetables and citrusy fruit for warmer notes of coffee and chocolate. Let's try the lightly roasted. A lot of sea really note the bitterness also coming. It's very interesting, so you have some kind of bitterness, but it's a very light, there's only a small kind of flavor of, of this roasted flavor, of this earthy flavor as well, so it's red, it stays very light. And now let's go for the darker roasted or medium roast. Mm, mm -hmm. mm. Strong in smokiness, so really strong in smokiness. This is cereal and I have chocolate flavor. So this one, my favorite. 
Although hojicha has a very dark color, it is still considered to be a type of green tea. Almost all tea produced in Japan is green tea, but there are some great Japanese oolong and black teas out there, and we will be getting a chance to try one of these next. Black teas are made from fully oxidized tea leaves, which gives them a flavor quite different than green tea. So this is black tea? Mm. Very smooth. What I realized a little bit about the Japanese <laughs> is there's a strong caramel note, note always with the, with the black tea from Japan. Good note. Um, um, my knowledge about black tea is very small, but often when you have like a black tea from other regions, there's much more sweetness into it. Here you often have this typical caramel note coming from the black tea. So this is what I, from my vast experience of Japanese black tea, I know. I realize that they often have a nice note of caramel, but not too much sweetness otherwise to the tea. Before we get to our final course, we are served a variety of seasonal food pairings to go with our tea. Because it's springtime in Japan, of course the food pairings revolve around sakura, or cherry blossom. These sweets help to smooth out some of the bitterness of the tea, and also bring out certain flavor characteristics. Dates with walnut and butter. Amazing. I love it. Mm. Finally, we come to the much anticipated matcha course. This is a powdered green tea, so instead of using a teapot, the tea master will actually use a bowl and a whisk made out of a single piece of bamboo. The tea whisk is carefully carved so that the small bristles can move through the water quickly and aerate the tea. With the right technique, this will create a nice foam on top of the matcha and give it a smoother taste and texture. Fresh cut grass, like just when you cut it and you walk the first time over the grass, it smells exactly like this. Mm. Mm -hmm. It's a very light, very, very light matcha. There's a little bit of astringency to it, but it's a light one, so it's not a lot of sweetness developing. So. I, I expected it to be a little bit stronger, but it is, it is a light one, so it's more fresher, like a summer matcha, you might say. To expand our palate for Japanese green tea, we want to try as many different types of tea as possible here in Tokyo. We heard there was a great tea shop called Higashiya that serves a wide variety of different tea types. So we hopped on the train and headed off to Ginza, home of some of Japan's most high-end shopping streets. Right in the heart of Ginza is another tea shop that still serves tea the traditional way. This tea master is using a gaiwan, or lidded bowl. This is more commonly used for Chinese teas, while the Kyusu teapot is used for Japanese green teas. The benefit of this teapot is that the hollow side handle helps to keep your hands from getting burned, and they allow for more refined movements when pouring the tea. Rather than tasting teas in courses, this tea shop actually allows you to pick individual teas from a wide range of options. When you lay out all the tea leaves together like this, you really get a sense of just how many different types of teas are out there. Of course the flavors are all different, but the leaves themselves look different as well. You may notice that some of the leaves contain stems in addition to the leaves. These are known as stem teas and they are made with a combination of both the stems and the leaves of the tea plant. The most common types are kukicha, a standard stem tea, and karigane, a stem tea made from shaded tea plants. That's completely different to the uh, one yesterday, yeah? So, like, so this tea here has a really uh, sweet, strong floral note. That's what he said us, said us when he served the tea. It's really that the, that's the most sweet tea they have. What's interesting in comparison, for example, to the Kyokuro, where you have a lot of this savory note, here you have a light, small, fine astringency, so a delicate astringency, you might say, which is developing a little bit in the mouth but it's so strong in the floral note which is quite impressive so floral note is definitely the predominant note of this tea and a lot of kind of sweetness but no sugary sweetness so like uh, this, this, this fruity sweetness is so in this tea very strong. After exploring a few tea shops that prepare tea the traditional way, we wanted to see how modern Tokyo tea lovers like to drink their tea. For this, we headed west to Setagaya to check out the world's first drip green tea cafe. This method may be familiar to fans of premium coffee as it uses a pour over method. 
The tea leaves are placed into this ceramic cone, which is tapered off towards the bottom, and then it's stopped by this wooden stopper. After pouring the water and waiting a few seconds, the tea master pulls this cone up and the tea begins to flow into the cup below. Because the leaves are in contact with the water for only a short amount of time, the extraction is lighter and sweeter, and the tea pairs beautifully with this daifuku, a sweet made from rice dough filled with anko, or sweet azuki bean paste. The tea master infuses the leaves three times to fully extract the flavor. In general, Japanese green tea leaves can be brewed three times or more, and each infusion is different. The first infusion tends to be the sweetest and most complex in flavor, while the second one develops more of these strong steamed vegetable notes. By the third infusion, the tea still provides a lot of good flavors, but the intensity becomes much milder. To improve the flavor, the tea master actually adds toasted rice to the tea leaves before infusing it a third time. Tea leaves and toasted rice is actually a very popular type of blended tea called genmaicha, or toasted rice tea. This started out as a way to conserve tea leaves during times of famine, but it has actually become a well-appreciated green tea in its own right. To see modern tea culture at its finest, we would need to head to Shibuya, home of the busiest crosswalk in the world. At this famous crosswalk, up to 3,000 people can cross at a single light, and as many as 500,000 can cross in a given day. Just a few streets away from this busy foot traffic lies an oasis called Gengen An, a modern tea shop that combines great tea with music. This is a perfect place to hang out with friends, listen to music, and drink a nice cup of hojicha. In much of Tokyo, tea takes on a social connotation. The modern tea drinker may not have time to sit down to a two hour long tea session in the middle of the day, but many make the time to enjoy a cup of tea with a friend or enjoy Enjoy a masterfully prepared bowl of matcha with a good meal at places like Chacha Noma and Amote Sando. When people are really in a hurry, they stop for tea at one of Tokyo's many vending machines, positioned at nearly every corner of the city. With one vending machine for every 23 residents, it's estimated that in Tokyo, you'll only need to walk on average 12 meters to reach one. These vending machines are outfitted with heating and cooling units, providing hot drinks in the winter and cold drinks in the summer. Although these bottled teas are not the ideal way to drink green tea, they have been known to outsell sugary soft drinks and coffee, which is pretty impressive for an unsweetened drink. Finally, on our Tokyo tea journey, we head to one of the largest tourist attractions, Sensoji Temple. The path leading up to the temple is filled with different shops that cater mostly to tourists, looking to sample all sorts of Japanese desserts. One of the most popular flavors for desserts here is green tea, including green tea candy and green tea ice cream. These desserts are not made from premium matcha, but actually from a lower grade matcha powder called culinary grade matcha. The premium matcha used for tea ceremonies is carefully produced so it develops a natural sweetness to it. This allows it to be smooth enough to drink plain. When you're adding cream and sugar to the powder like you would if you were making a matcha ice cream for example, the matcha powder doesn't need to be that sweet. This allows producers to skip a few steps in the production process and produce a slightly lower quality matcha powder. Because the tea is powdered, it can be added to just about any food to give it a green tea flavor. Throughout our time in Tokyo, the most important thing we learned is that everyone, no matter how busy they are, can find time for tea. Whether it's a two hour long tea session or a quick bottle tea on the way to work, tea is an important part of daily life here. It's good to know that despite rapid changes in consumer behavior, tea is still here to stay. After learning about the different types of teas, it's time to head out into the fields to see how they are produced. We begin in a region very close to Tokyo called Shizuoka. Shizuoka is Japan's largest tea growing region. It's here at the foot of the beautiful and iconic Mount Fuji that 40% of all Japanese tea is produced. The landscape of Shizuoka is quite mountainous and some farmers tend to remote tea fields far away from their towns. For the most part, these mountain tea fields are left on their own to produce a more wild tea. Most farmers prefer to grow tea closer to where they live. In the case of this couple in Shizuoka, they decided to grow tea in their very own backyard. This family has been growing tea on this small plot of land around their home for the past few decades. After they had their first child, they began to become concerned with all the pesticides and chemicals they were using on their field. They decided to make the switch to a more natural and sustainable way of farming, and the health of their tea field saw some great improvements. If you look carefully at the rows in between these tea plants, you'll notice a blanket of leaves. This was intentionally put here as a type of fertilizer. The philosophy here is that instead of introducing outside material into the tea field, they instead take what grows on the field naturally and use that to help support the growth of the tea. These farmers will gather plant material from elsewhere in the tea field 
break it up into a mulch and place it in between the rows. This way, nothing on the field is wasted and all the nutrients can be recycled. The true measure of a tea is not how it's grown, but how it tastes. This assessment happens back at their home in the tasting room. We're just doing a tasting right now at Taru E Secha. I have a Yabukita Secha here. It's got a really nice color to it. It's um, kind of in between a jade green and a golden color. Um, and I get a little bit of this vegetal flavor in the beginning and it's got a little bit of a dry finish to it, but it's very fresh, very vegetal, um, and it, just a little bit of dryness to it. So there's just, there's not really much astringency, but it's just a, a slight dryness on the, the top of the tongue um, in, the, in the last tasting. On this field, they produce multiple types of sencha, as well as a hojicha and a black tea. 70% of the tea produced in Japan is green tea, although there are a few farmers in this area that produce black teas, known as kolcha. These tea leaves are allowed to oxidize fully after being picked, giving them a darker color and a warmer flavor profile. This family is also experimenting with grinding tea leaves to make matcha, or powdered tea. This powdered tea is mixed into a bowl using a bamboo whisk or chasen. The purpose of whisking is to create this nice foam on top to give the tea a creamier texture and taste. So I just got my first test. They presented me with this bowl of matcha and now I have to make it myself. Um, so there are some crumbs in here so the first thing I'm going to do is make sure that I break all those up and then after I've scraped off the sides I'm going to do a little M shape here. So basically what I'm doing right now is I'm aerating the matcha. So this is going to give it a smoother mouthfeel and a creamier taste. So you can see you got these very small bubbles here um, and that's really what you want. You want it to be um, have a lot of air in there but not very big bubbles. You want the bubbles to be really small, so it tastes almost like a latte. The flavor of the tea isn't the only consideration the farmer has to make. They also have to be sure to share the land with the local flora and fauna. The tea fields are not only home to small insects and birds, but larger animals as well. At the tea field of Zen Koan in Shimada, you can occasionally see Japanese siro grazing on the vegetation between the tea fields. One of the benefits of growing tea without the use of pesticides or chemicals is that you allow not just the tea to grow, but a diverse array of plant life as well. This plant life can support these larger animals as they graze the fields throughout the day. So those animals that you just saw were coming here to feast on some of the foliage. Um, so like as you can see here, um, this is something that some of the wild animals would come around to eat. There's also some wild pigs that will actually uh, dig through this soil and um, eat some of the earthworms and grubs from the soil. So as you can see here, we're really deep in the countryside. Uh, this is not those flat manicured fields that you see elsewhere. This really is part of nature. The farmers here understand that in order to produce tea in a sustainable way, they have to share the land with the local flora and fauna. This is done by fertilizing the tea plants, not with chemicals, but with a combination of minerals and organic material. So here we are in the workshop at uh, Zen Koan, and uh, we have a few different types of fertilizers that they use here. All of them are organic. So um, this right here is a charcoal fertilizer. Um, so you can see this is kind of like a burnt wood um, in little tiny chips here. And then over here, we have a, a mineral fertilizer made from um, plants and shells and things like that. And then this is actually kombu or kelp. So this is like a kelp-based fertilizer. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna mix all of these together in a certain ratio, and that's gonna be the fertilizer that they put on the plants every November.
Shizuoka is a large region producing many different types of teas, but like all regions, it has its specialties. A majority of the tea produced in Shizuoka is Sencha, a basic Japanese green tea made from steamed leaves. This region is also well known for its Fukumushi Sencha, or deep steam Sencha. This tea is easy to spot for its vibrant green color and its strong vegetal taste profile. To make this tea, the leaves need to be steamed for a longer time, about 30 seconds or more. This breaks down the leaf and allows more of it to flow into the cup. This was a relatively modern invention, dating back to the 20th century. At the time, a lot of the tea produced here was found to be slightly bitter. Farmers found that by steaming the tea for a longer time, they could actually smooth out the flavor and make it more enjoyable. At the farm of Mr. Masuda, the farmers produce a whole variety of teas, including these deep steamed Fukumushi teas. Today they will be testing their teas to see which ones exhibit the qualities that are most desirable in Japanese green tea. Japanese tea is not good if served with uh, hot soda. ボイルドウォーター。なるほど、我々はネットで入れる理由、今ネットです。はい。However, to really stress the tea, to bring out a little bit the negative side so that you see the whole spectrum of the tea. The Fukumushi tea being compared here begins to create a cloudier infusion as the leaves are more brittle and more easily infused into the water. The person evaluating the teas will judge not only the taste of the leaves, but also the aroma and the appearance of the leaves. The tea produced here is not only for consumers, but also for other tea companies as well. Some tea producers specialize in creating the finished tea, so they will buy tea leaves grown from other farmers and put the finishing touches on them at their own facility. This unfinished tea, which is sold to other tea companies, is aracha, or unrefined tea. So actually here you have a two, uh, you have an aracha and this is a final tea. So the main differences are here you have 7% water, here 3% water and uh, you see here you even got the stems in. So it's a mix of everything and in the production what we saw uh, before is actually the stems are separated in two different, uh, two different processes and here you really have uh, the final uh, sencha and here also the needles are shorter. So a longer one here is of this size, and when you take here a longer needle, it's actually of this size because also here the needles are cut slightly. <laughs> Shizuoka is not only home to smaller farmers, but also larger businesses as well. As these businesses begin to grow, it becomes more difficult for them to manage the quality of the tea produced as they need to produce larger quantities. The farmers at Osada have come up with an innovative solution to this problem. Once a small family business, they have successfully grown into a full-sized operation, employing quite a few people in the area of Shizuoka. Although the company has grown, it is still owned and managed by the Osada family. They actually built a production facility up here in the mountains to be closer to their farmers. This right here is the key to their ability to maintain a high standard of quality. The area is known as Isagawa, or the Organic Village. It's a collection of small farmers that have all agreed to not use pesticides on their field so that they can maintain more natural tea fields. To be considered organic, not only does the farm need to not use pesticides, but no adjacent farm can use pesticides either. By working together, these farmers are able to maintain the health of their tea fields, but also the surrounding ecosystem. In these mountain tea fields, the terrain tends to be slightly more rocky. This creates a mineral-rich growing environment for the tea plants, which can even translate into the taste. The Sencha Isagawa produced here has these fresher citrusy notes to it, with a mineral profile that is heavier on the palate. Although the demand for tea is quite high, there are signs that it may be beginning to slow down. The sad truth is that the younger generations are less interested in loose leaf tea produced the traditional way and find it tough to resist the convenience of bottled tea and coffee. As the awareness and appreciation for premium green tea declines, it becomes more difficult for farmers to make a living producing tea using these careful techniques. In order to keep these traditions alive, younger farmers will eventually need to take over the tea fields. We met a group of farmers that are trying to change that. These younger farmers at Matcha Organic Japan bought a plot of land from older tea farmers, allowing them to retire with dignity, knowing that their farms are in good hands. We're here at the tea fields of uh, Organic Matcha Japan. 
and um, what is actually something which always occurred to us or whether a story which we heard a lot uh, ourselves is that the, or the Japanese tea industry is really changing and often elderly people they don't have children anymore who um, want to do the farming so you have often the situation that you have tea fields which are abandoned or tea fields uh, where the people just to get, get too old to really do them. But here we have a wonderful example where the, an older generation of farmers had tea fields but they couldn't do them anymore. And uh, the team around Organic Matcha Japan, they really um, took them over so they rent them at the moment and uh, they started this in 2016, so three years ago, and expanded it now from six um, hectares of organic tea to 10 hectares. So next year they will harvest in total 10 hectares of organic tea fields, and uh, they will add also additional um, tea plants, so types of tea plants, like for example, the Goko cultivar, or other cultivars which then will be sold by them and uh, be added to this beautiful field which we can see behind me. Although the tea industry faces many challenges, the farmers in Shizuoka are well equipped to handle them. The men and women that grow tea here are talented, capable, but most importantly, they care greatly for the land that they look after. You can really see the level of thought that they put into everything they do and it really shows in the tea they produce. After learning about how tea is produced, it's time to take a quick break to learn a little bit about the history of tea in Japan. For this, we head west to the city of Kyoto. Kyoto is considered by many to be the cultural heart of Japan. While it doesn't have the largest population, it more than makes up for it with its rich history and impressive list of world heritage sites. Kyoto was the main seat of power in Japan for over a thousand years, and that stretch of time saw an impressive blossoming of culture and tradition, much of which can still be seen today. We're going to travel around the area of Kyoto and track down the origins of tea. We'll discover where in Japan it was first consumed, first cultivated, and how it was served to people throughout history. We'll also explore different innovations in the production of tea that led it to become as popular as it is today. To start off our journey, we're going to be heading south to the city of Nara. The earliest records of tea consumption in Japan date back to the 8th century. During this time, the city of Nara was the first permanent capital of Japan, and Chinese teas were consumed by the monks and by the emperor. It was common for Buddhist monks and diplomats to take trips to China and bring back cultural practices as well as literature and art to share with people in Japan. Tea was one of the many practices that made its way from China to Japan. The monks were among the first to consume tea in early Japan, and they found that the tea helped them stay calm and alert during long periods of meditation. We now know that this is due to the combination of caffeine and L-theanine, which is almost unique to the tea plant. The L-theanine stimulates alpha brainwave activity, which are the same brainwaves stimulated during meditation. Although there are records of tea being consumed in Japan as early as the 8th century, the first record of the plant being cultivated in Japan wasn't until 1191, when the monk Eisai brought back tea seeds from China and planted them on the grounds of Kozanji Temple outside Kyoto. This temple is in the Togano Mountains. Togano tea was once considered the finest tea in all of Japan, and many only considered the tea real if it was grown in this area. In 1214, the monk Eisai introduced tea to the samurai class. The value of tea to the samurai was originally limited to helping cure their hangovers, but later on they accepted it once they embraced the principles of Zen Buddhism. Tea and Zen Buddhism were often intertwined throughout history. Dogen even included notes on serving tea during Buddhist rituals, and Muso Soseki even stated that tea and Zen are one. In these times, the consumption of tea was mostly limited to the monks, but later on the nobility began to take notice of this drink and its effects. Throughout medieval Japan, there was fierce competition between different factions, not just over territory, but also over prestige. Because tea was seen as a beverage of sophistication, it became an object of focus for the competing upper classes of Japan, as they began to collect ornate teaware and build luxurious tea rooms outside Outside of Kyoto. They would even invite guests to take part in their tea ceremonies at these estates. The primary purpose of a lot of these opulent accessories and tea ceremonies was to showcase their wealth and thus reinforce their power and prestige. In the middle of the turbulent Sengoku period, a man known as Sen no Rikyu came along with a more humble vision of what the tea ceremony should look like. Rather than a gold-plated facade, Rikyu advocated for a small, rustic tea house away from the noise of the city. Rikyu also left behind a set of principles on which the modern tea ceremony is built, and these are Wa, Ke, Se, Jaku. Harmony, respect, purity, and tranquility. 
The first step of the tea ceremony begins not when you step inside the tea room, but actually on the path leading up to it. The gardens around the tea house serve as a way to quiet the mind and are meant to be an extension of the natural surroundings. This is the first example of the principle harmony. Just as there must be harmony between the host and the guest of the tea ceremony, so too must there be harmony between the tea house and the natural world around it. The guests will first purify their hands at the sukubai outside of the tea house. The guests are not only purifying their hands, but also purifying their hearts and minds before entering the tea room. Once they have washed away their worldly thoughts and worries, only then are they able to step into the tea room. This represents another principle of the tea ceremony, purity. To enter the tea house, a guest must walk through a small door in the side of the tea room. This makes it so that all guests must bow when entering the tea room. Emperors must bow, samurai must bow, commoners must bow. Inside the tea room, all guests are equal, regardless of their status outside. This begins to touch on the third principle of the tea ceremony, respect. Respect is the ability to understand and respect others, even those you may disagree with or see as different. Once the host and the guest have found common ground with one another, they can enjoy something as simple as a bowl of tea in silence. Once the first three principles of the tea ceremony are embraced, only then can the fourth be attained, and that is tranquility, a feeling of enlightenment or selflessness. To put these principles into practice, we will be heading off to Uji, a short 20 minute journey from Kyoto. It's here that tea culture really expanded, thanks in no small part to the tea ceremony. At Taiwan Tea House, House in Uji, you can get a look back in time to see a traditional tea ceremony performed just as it has been for hundreds of years. When entering the tea house, the first thing you will notice is that the interior is modestly decorated with a small flower arrangement and a scroll to set the intention of the tea ceremony. The tea master will present their guests with a type of sweet, also called wagashi. These sweets can vary depending on the season and also change with the theme of the tea ceremony. In this particular tea ceremony, there is a second tea master who will be preparing the tea. The tea master bows before entering into the room, at which point the guests are expected to bow back. At this point, she brings the tea utensils into the room, sets them down, and then brings in the hishaku or bamboo ladle. The tea bowl is then placed in front of her, along with the natsume or tea caddy. She then pulls out a special cloth called a fukusa, which is folded a certain way and then used to purify the tea utensils. She starts by purifying the natsume and then will fold up the fukusa once more and move on to the next utensil. The second utensil she purifies is called the chashaku, and this is the bamboo spoon used for scooping matcha from the natsume into the bowl. She will set these utensils down next to the bamboo tea whisk or chasen and then use the fukusa to purify the hishaku or bamboo ladle. She will use this bamboo ladle to scoop hot water out of the iron pot or kama. The water is then poured into the tea bowl or chawan in order to preheat it. The water is also used to prepare the bamboo tea whisk. The bristles of the tea whisk are quite fragile when they're dry so many tea masters soak the whisk before using it so that it doesn't break while whisking the tea. It also helps keep the bowl warm so that it doesn't cool off the tea too much. The tea master Master will then pour this water out into the kensui or wastewater bowl as it will not be used to make the tea. She will then use a separate cloth to clean off the bowl called a chakin. After all utensils have been purified and prepared, she will then use the chashaku to scoop matcha powder into the tea bowl. For this, she uses two large scoops of the chashaku. She will then add hot water from the kama to the chawan and begin to whisk up the tea. First, she will start by scraping off the sides of the tea bowl and then she will begin whisking up the tea in zigzag motions. This process will take about 30 seconds to thoroughly mix the powder into the water and also create a foam on top of the tea. After the tea has been whisked, the tea master will then turn the bowl so that the design faces the guest and then the bowl will be offered to the guest. During some tea ceremonies, the bowl of tea will be passed from guest to guest, but in this tea ceremony, two bowls of tea are prepared. The second one is whisked up using the same technique. After the guest finishes the bowl of tea, they will put it on the opposite side of the tatami mat to signify they are finished with the tea ceremony. For hundreds of years, Uji was the hub of tea cultivation in early Japan, and it still maintains much of that status today, particularly for matcha. Many tourists come to Uji every year to take part in tea ceremonies at Taiwan Tea House and to visit the many matcha shops between Uji Station and Byoroin Temple. In the surrounding areas of Ogura and Ujitawara, there are many historical sites used to commemorate the invention of Sencha and Gyokoro tea. In the 1500s and 1600s, matcha was the primary way to consume green tea in Japan, but that all changed with the invention of Nagatani Soen. This tea grower in Uji discovered that rather than grinding the tea leaves into a powder, they could be steamed, rolled, and dried to maintain their flavor for long periods of time. They could then be prepared in a teapot and poured into a cup. This discovery allowed Nagatani Soen to popularize the use of Sencha tea, now by far the most common type of green tea in Japan. The childhood home of Nagatani Soen is now a popular tourist attraction, and a nearby shrine was built to commemorate his discovery of Sencha in 1737. Larger Japanese tea companies fund the upkeep of this shrine in order to pay their respects to the father of modern Japanese green tea. If you 
ever get to visit Uji, it may be worth a short trip over to Uji Tawara to see this site for yourself. Another important discovery in the history of Japanese green tea happened at this site in Ogura. A tea merchant by the name Yamamoto Kahe had traveled around Japan to study tea cultivation, and he noticed that certain family farms would cover the tea plants to protect them from the cold. By cutting off the sunlight from the plants, it actually made the tea sweeter. He began to implement this method, and in 1841, he created a long shaded tea that developed a green residue during the production process. He nicknamed this tea Gyokuro, or Jade Dew. Gyokuro became famous for its trademark sweet and savory flavor, and this sparked a renaissance in the production of Japanese green teas. Farmers now could experiment with different levels of shading, different steaming, rolling, and drying techniques to create the wide array of tea varieties we see today. In the early 20th century, another important tea production method was created, and that was roasting. This practice began in Kyoto and later spread out to all of Japan. By roasting the teas, farmers and producers were able to create a completely unique tasting experience, playing off of these warmer notes of coffee, caramel, and chocolate. Starting in the mid-20th century, the tea production process in Japan became much more industrialized. The harvesting of the tea could be done by machine, and so could the steaming, rolling, and drying. This allows the farmers to produce tea more efficiently with less manual labor. Certain tea factories in Japan are almost completely automated, taking in fresh leaves and moving them through the production with a series of conveyor belts. With all this modern innovation, there are still a few farmers who continue to produce tea the more traditional way, on small plots of land in the countryside. To meet one of these farmers, we head south of the city to the small town of Wazuka to meet a farmer that is embracing the old way of tea. Okay, so uh, we are here in Kyoto again and we met Mr. Noike, who has decided a couple of years ago, about 10 years ago, to come from the city back to, well, not back, but to actually start a lifestyle in the uh, in Japanese countryside and start produce, to produce tea because it's, it's beautiful out here. And um, he showed us his fields uh, all around, um, which is actually surrounded by a forest. And that, there's an interesting story there. Noike-san, how do この京都にはえっとですね、もの昔からこういう山がちなところで作っていた産地なんですけれども、あの、こういう山がちなところにお茶を作るとあの、日陰になる時間があったり、こう、日が当たる時間があったり。So basically if you if you produce uh, tea in a in a um in a, in a valley then you have two things that are very good for tea leaves. One is that there's not, it's not constantly, there's no constant light that falls on the, on the tea leaves and therefore the, the, the texture of them becomes, um, becomes something that is very positive for tea and, and there's more sweetness because there's more shadow on them and less of this um, bitter taste is being produced. Secondly, the, there's there's the the fog that covers tea leaves occasionally and that is also positive for rather sweet taste of tea so since all times actually it's more likely to it's, it's more used to make that tea is made in these kind of valleys instead of large flat areas although that's by now also a common method to to create tea <laughs> Actually, it's often said that if you do these kind of things, you should just throw a, a pin on a, on a map and then follow wherever the pin lands. But that's not his reason to be here. He was a university student when he came for the first time here, more by chance, in order to work in a uh, to work on a, on a farm, on a tea farm, and then he just liked it and decided to stay and worked as a part-time job with farmers and then he's actually a farming spin-off of, uh, of somebody else who, who worked here, with whom he worked before and now he has his own land, about one hectare, uh, he told me even before. Uh, that that he's working on only organically. So it's not. I'm not really like Okay, he doesn't necessarily want to produce more tea in the future on, on, on more fields, but rather stay small and produce good and tasty tea with the 
uh, with what he's got at the moment. No matter how much time passes, there are still lessons to be learned by doing things the old way. Sometimes it's best to remove our modern distractions and embrace a simpler life, whether that be moving out into the countryside and enjoying a slower pace, or just taking the time to sit in silence and sip a bowl of tea every once in a while. Throughout our journey in Kyoto, we have seen tea transform and reach every strata of Japanese society. What was once only consumed in the temples around Kyoto is now enjoyed all over Japan. By understanding the journey that tea has taken over the years and all the work that went into making it what it is today has really led us to an even greater appreciation of the drink and what it represents. We continue our tea journey by heading south of the main Japanese island of Honshu to the smaller island of Kyushu. In the southern island of Kyushu, the tea farmers benefit from warm subtropical climates and rich fertile soils. When exploring this area, you'll notice a diverse array of different tea varieties. This is because the winters here are much milder, meaning that more delicate types of tea plants are able to be grown without being damaged by the frost. We begin our journey in the area of Kumamoto in central Kyushu. On this farm, Mr. Fujisako produces a unique type of tea called Tamari Okucha, or curled tea. So we are here at uh, the tea field um, of Satoru Fujisako in Kumamoto. And uh, what, is a, what we see here behind us is actually a tea field where he creates his uh, two uh, most expensive and most valuable tea. Uh, is uh, the Tamari Okucha Besako and Tamari Okucha Hinokuni. And uh, we can see here we took uh, one leaf actually which he is using for these two teas. And important about this tea is that he actually uses only the first harvest. As soon as he has the second, third or even fourth harvest, he only produces bancha. But these two teas, they're uh, only harvested from the first flush. To make top quality green teas, the youngest sprouts are often used, whereas a tea like bancha is made from more mature leaves. This gives tamari okucha a sweeter and fresher taste, while the bancha takes on more of these earthy and mineral rich flavors. So uh, for the bancha actually, um, he, he uses much more. So just uh, here, for example, here we have the top of the plant for his uh, highest grade tea, the bizako. The bizako, uh, the tamari okucha bizako, he uses this part here, so this is really the upper part. If he does bancha, so which is coming from the second or third harvest, it's actually this part of the plant down until here, which is used. So um, he uses as well the stem, uh, as he uh, explained us for the bancha, and sometimes even you see that the, the leaves are much thicker. Here it's very fine, and here you have uh, thicker leaves which are then used also for the bancha. So bancha is actually um, a rougher tea, not as highly uh, selected as uh, the normal tea uh, or as his high grade teas. And here you also use the thicker and uh, less high quality leaves. When visiting the field, it became clear to us the difference between the conventional and organic farming methods. These two different types of tea fields were positioned side by side, so you could really get a clear comparison. So we're here again on the non-organic field, and what you can see here below us are actually the uh, bags they use for the chemicals. So these are uh, the chemical bags, how um, with the pesticides in them, which is in a kind of uh, powder form. And uh, it makes actually all the plants grow in a very nice way. What uh, Satoru Fujisako told us as well, that actually the pesticides, it is said that they are washed away in the production process. But what happens is due to the rain, the pesticides, pesticides they go into the earth and are finally absorbed by the plant. So they go also in the inside of the leaf, which you cannot uh, wash outside uh, away. So actually the pesticides you have in each tea which is used and planted with pesticides you also have pesticides in. What is also uh, astonishing is that you can see here the earth is really black and there's no grass, nearly nothing growing on it. And now when we go on the other side actually here where the organic field is what you can see is that I'm uh, walking on green grass here everything is growing and everything seems more natural you also have more space here you, you hear more birds you see more flies flying around so there's 
on this field you have uh, nature really packed together and everything seems to be in a symbiotic uh, equality and uh, equilibrium meanwhile there you see nearly only the tea growing and everything else is kind of shut down or brought to a minimum. While the conventional farming produces a less healthy ecosystem, it's difficult to ignore the effect that it has on the short-term growth of the tea plant. It is far less labor-intensive for farmers to use these powerful pesticides and fertilizers, so it's often difficult for them to transition to organic farming. So if we first go uh, to uh, the non-organic, we are around two weeks away from the harvest, what you can see is that it's already very beautiful green. Uh, the sprouts are already nicely developed. So um, what I would pick here are the up three, three upper parts, um, and they're really finely developed. So here we are very, very close to the final harvest um, on the non-organic field. What we also can see is that actually the earth is pretty hard and uh, more solid than uh, with uh, now the organic farm. What we can see here is now the organic field. So already the color is different. It's not so greenish. It's more, um, you might say, more natural. And we see also that the sprouts, they are much, much, much smaller. Um, here are some bigger ones, but in general the whole plant is less developed. So here, after the farmer uh, Fujisako, he said that around three weeks from now there will be the harvest. And also the soil, what you can see is the soil of the organic field is really soft. So you can really go in and make nearly holes with your bare hand. So this is also something which is really, uh, which is particular for the organic field. But mainly you really see that here you have more like a uh, saturated green color, not so much grown. And if we go here on the uh, non-organic field, it's much greener and already more developed as they're using as well uh, growth hormones to uh, push the growth of the plant. The early days of organic farming can be difficult for farmers like Fujisako. A few decades ago, he decided that the right thing to do was to stop using pesticides on his field. He had to handle the expenses of this transition as well as lower crop yields in the initial few years, which both put tremendous strain on him and his family. All of these were endured in the pursuit of more sustainable farming. Now, because his tea is completely organic, environmentally minded customers are willing to pay a premium for it. We are thankful to Mr. Fujisako for the sacrifices he made as well as the delicious tea he produced. Next on our journey, we travel to the mountainous prefecture of Miyazaki in central Kyushu to learn about a tea that is quite rare in Japan. Most Japanese green teas are steamed after harvesting, and most Chinese green teas are pan-fired, but occasionally you find an exception to that rule. Kamaitacha, or pan-fired tea, is a Japanese tea, but it's made in the Chinese style, giving it characteristics of both. When the tea leaves are turned in a hot pan, they inherit more of these warmer notes of toasted almonds, cashews, and a tiny hint of caramel. Although this tea is uncommon in Japan as a whole, the area of Miyazaki specializes in the production of this pan-fired tea. To meet one of the farmers, we will head to Takachiho, a small town in Miyazaki prefecture. We meet with the farmer Mr. Issen and his family and sit down for a cup of tea in their 200-year-old home, which was once used by samurai but now hosts three generations of family members. So we are here in an ancient house of the farmer Issen and what you can see here is actually a door and this part here, so this piece of wood is made out of one tree. So this is one big tree and they make just a very fine uh, part out of this one here and you can really see that this is the stem and additionally to it that you can see that there originally was a dragon drawing on this piece of wood so you can slightly still see the dragon. During the tea tasting, we got a chance to try out the hojicha, kamaiiracha, and oolong teas produced by the family. We were particularly fond of the kamaiiracha and were curious to see how it was grown and produced. So we're here on another field of the prefecture of Miyazaki and uh, we're in the middle of a beautiful Yabukita field and Yabukita is a cultivar which is actually um, growing faster so the sprouts are already out so if you go down on the plant 
here we can really see that some of them they are pretty uh, showing up beautifully and all the sprouts here they're also already quite quite good grown and um, all the fields here so we have one field here and below we have one and then behind and behind the fourth one these are all yabukita fields um, growing at the same pace so they will be harvested all of them at the exact same time another thing we noticed on the tea fields was the soil beneath the tea plants which was covered with an organic fertilizer so what you can you can really see them here so it's a um, it's a mix of rice holes um, with grass and fertilizer of rape seeds so it's really a beautiful mix which keeps the soil soft and it nourishes the soil also to have just a perfect nourishment of the tea plant and finally this creates then the beautiful taste of the first harvest of the Ichibacha. Because organic farmers don't use conventional fertilizers, they often end up making their own out of natural ingredients they find on the farm. In the case of Mr. Issen, he will combine discarded rice hulls with organic grapeseed fertilizer to make a type of nutrient-rich mulch. This is the organic grapeseed fertilizer which is used on his fields and uh, this is one uh, he uh, purchases on the market and this is an organic certified um, fertilizer and then this one here nourishes really the plants um, coming uh, from uh, rapeseed and used to make really <laughs> and he's the boss he's the boss you're hungry so this never happened this is the closest i got to chicken besides uh if i'm in a restaurant haha <laughs> really careful but so I got already two. And if I close it, you pick my book. book. Yeah. <laughs> After the tea plants are harvested, they are processed right here on his property. He set up a small production facility in his backyard so he and his family could keep a close eye on the roasting of the teas. Hello everybody, we are here at the Isien Kamaidicha production. So what we will do now is just walk you through, through the whole production. So follow me. So, first step, the most important step of the Kamaicha production is actually the um, Kamaicha oven. So, this is the most important part here. When the leaves uh, arrive, um, they are uh, put first through the containers, there, which you can see there, over there, and then they just put up here, um, over this part in the machine here on the right and then coming slowly but surely into the oven, falling down here and then coming in this part here where actually the oven is heated up to 350 degrees Celsius. And uh, you got a tube inside where the leaf, they're just turned with this tube and the metal really gets to 350 degrees up. Then in a second step, they get through this tube uh, to the upper part. The upper part here is then again 200 degrees hot and um, they have kind of a second slightly slight roasting of the leaves, always turned, still containing um, uh, a lot of moisture, but getting really um, here slightly roasted in this part and then coming into the next steps. The next steps they are mainly made through the through turning of the leaves, different kinds of turning, once it's rolling, once in, is this uh, brush turning as well. And with each step, the moisture gets more and more out of the, um, of the leaves. And with each step, uh, the leaves get drier and drier. So here we are maybe around 20% of moisture still in the leaves. So I'll just show you how it looks inside. So um, here really uh, the leaves are pushed against the wood. So they lose with each turn more and more of its moisture. 
second part of um, heating um, here the oven is only around 150 degrees hot and again you can see there are uh, stones with a flame so these are small ovens giving a, again this slightly roasted flavor of the kamaericha and this is really the last part where you also have the separation of hochicha so hochicha is really roasted tea or the kamaericha which is slightly roasted tea so when i just open this here up so this is actually a pan um, which is heated up to around 100 degrees when it is open 112 degrees when it is closed and here the, the leaves stay just for one hour and this gives it the final, um, the final touch of this slightly roasted uh, taste and uh, when you want to do hochicha you just go up to 140 degrees and then you're gonna get this dark roasted and nearly chocolatey flavor then out of the hochicha and these then give the two different teas. As you can see, whether a farmer is producing a roasted tea, a tamario kucha, or a bancha, it all begins with having a level of care and respect for the tea plant. On this field in Takachiho, Mr. Issen is growing the next generation of tea plants. With the love and care of the Issen family, as well as the great nourishment of the fertilizer he created, these tea plants will have a bright future ahead of them and will likely be used to produce plenty of delicious teas in the future. As you travel south to the southern tip of the island of Kyushu, you get to the region of Kagoshima. This prefecture surrounds an active volcano in a large bay and is home to many tea fields growing a diverse array of different tea plants. Here the weather is much more tropical, which allows the farmers to grow more sensitive and delicate tea plants like the Saimidori, Asatsuyu, and Yutaka Midori. These tea plants are used to make sweeter green teas, which are often the most highly sought after. Today we're going to be visiting Mr. Sakamoto in the small town of Shibushi to learn how he makes the two most sought after green teas in Japan. Gyokuro and Matcha. Mr. Sakamoto has been working in the tea industry since he was a little boy. He and his brother would help out on the family farm and this experience taught him about green tea from a very young age. As he grew up, something began to happen at the tea field. He noticed some of his family members became stricken with illness and in some cases, cancer. One year, he lost his niece to her battle with cancer. He used his talent for painting to capture her in a work of art depicting her as a warrior, ready to do battle. The cherry blossom petals floating in the wind represent the impermanence of life, particularly one that was tragically cut short. He believed that the chemicals they were using on the field were partly to blame. When it was his turn to take over the family business in 1985, he decided to switch to completely organic farming. Decades ago, this method of farming without chemicals was uncommon and the path forward was unclear. He began experimenting with different types of fertilizer and finally found one that worked. He noticed that there was a lot of sedimentary rock in his region. These rocks and cliffs are made from mineral deposits over the course of millions of years, so it is no wonder that they are a good source of nutrients for the plant. He pulverizes this rock and blends it with Bokashi fertilizer, made from various organic foods. This activates the fertilizer so that the minerals can be readily absorbed by the plant. This fertilizer has become so successful that other tea farmers purchase it from his family to use in their own fields. Mr. Sakamoto claims that this fertilizer makes the plant stronger and healthier than those made with conventional fertilizers. He says that he can tell a non-organic plant from an organic plant just by looking at them. The non-organic tea leaves will be almost see-through if you hold them up to the light because the cellular structure is much less dense. If you take a clipping of the two different types of tea plants, the organic plant will hold onto its leaves for far longer. This is an experiment he often conducts to test the strength of his own tea plants versus other ones. But why is strength so important? Mr. Sakamoto specializes in the production of gyokuro, a tea that has grown under shade for the last three weeks of the harvest. During this time, the tea plant is cut off from sunlight, forcing it to produce more caffeine and chlorophyll. The shaded tea plants also contain more theanine, which is normally converted into catechins when the plant is exposed to sunlight. This theanine is an amino acid that gives tea its sweet and savory flavor, but it's also responsible for the calming sensation most people get when they drink tea. The catechins are the more bitter components of the leaf, and they are produced as protection from the UV light when the tea leaves are exposed to the sun. If a farmer wants to reduce 
the bitterness and maximize the sweetness in a tea, they need to limit the catechins the plant produces and maximize the theanine it retains. This long shading process can be stressful for the tea plant and it can begin to wilt if not taken care of properly. Most farmers solve this problem by applying chemical fertilizers and pesticides to help the plant cope with the added stress, but this option is off the table for organic farmers like Mr. Sakamoto. This is why he's so committed to growing these strong and healthy tea plants so that they can last through the extreme conditions that tea has to endure to become a gyokuro. After the shading process, the tea is ready to be harvested, which is done in the early to mid springtime. So um, we are here at the hand picking now in the middle of the fields. Um, so I just uh, explain you, we have been hand picking for um, just a while. This happens once a year, only one day a year they do it. We have here 70 people doing the hand picking. And what is important is really that you have here the three leaves. So you have the shin, which is actually the heart. And then you have the ichiome, which is the second leaf. This is this one. And the niome. And five millimeters below, you have to pop it up a little bit and then take it away. It's very easy to do. You have the three leaves and these are then the ones which are used for the green tea. After the leaves are picked, they are collected and processed in a small facility right on Mr. Sakamoto's property. The important thing here is that the leaves have to be steamed almost immediately after being picked. Otherwise, they will begin to oxidize and turn into a black tea. After the leaves are steamed, they go through a series of ovens to dry out the leaf. Here, the moisture content of the leaf needs to be taken down from 70% all the way to 4-7% to so that the leaves can properly infuse into the water. Right before the leaves are completely dried, they are shaped while they are still pliable. Gyokuro is known for these tight, needle-shaped leaves, and it has to go through an extra rolling process to get here. These brushes lightly push the leaves over these metal ridges, which rolls them over time. If you see a tea with these extra dark, pine needle-shaped leaves, it is likely a gyokuro. These leaves infuse to create a flavor profile that is extremely unique. Because of the high levels of L-theanine, the taste of this tea is strong on these sweet and savory notes. With some gyokuro, you even get a hint of fruitiness, steamed vegetables, and even seaweed. The texture and mouthfeel of this tea is thicker, and it's often drunk in these small glasses to appreciate not only the flavor, but also the texture. The guest is meant to savor each tiny sip as it slowly glides over the tongue, almost like an oil. These flavor profiles and textures are well sought after by gyokuro drinkers, and it's why gyokuro commands such a high price today. While gyokuro is considered to be the most sought after leaf tea in Japan, there is another tea that can rival gyokuro in both its savory flavor and its difficulty to produce. A high quality matcha is just as difficult to produce as gyokuro, if not more difficult. The growing of the tea is more or less the same, but there are two added steps that gyokuro does does not have. The first is the removal of the stems. These stems will make the matcha slightly less sweet, so they need to be removed before the tea is ground. Once these stems have been removed, the tea is called tencha, and it's one step away from becoming matcha. The final step is the actual grinding of the tea leaves. This is done in a large granite mill on Mr. Sakamoto's property. This stone mill has a vast network of grooves that push the leaves out of the sides as they are ground into a finer and finer powder. It takes this mill an hour just to produce about 50 grams of this precious matcha powder. Once the matcha powder is produced, you can whisk it up into a bowl with this chasen to create a beautifully foamy bowl of matcha tea. Matcha shares a lot of taste characteristics with gyokuro, but it's much more intense because you're drinking the entire leaf rather than just an extraction of the leaf. Both of these teas are high in caffeine and theanine, creating a long-lasting calm alert feeling that lasts throughout the day. The teas produced by Mr. Sakamoto are especially rich in flavor. The plants are able to draw a plethora of nutrients from the soil thanks to Mr. Sakamoto's unique farming methods. Because he doesn't use chemicals on the tea plant, the earthworms are able to thrive on this field, loosening up the soil as they burrow through the earth. This loose soil allows the roots of the tea plant to penetrate deeper into the ground and absorb more nutrients, improving the taste of the tea even further. So we're here at a complete new tea field with a new cultivar. So actually Mr. Sakamoto was also asked by the prefecture of Kagoshima to produce a new cultivar. And this cultivar is called Seime and it's a crossing of different cultivars. And this is going to be the first one uh, of this kind, first harvest will be in around three years so these plants as you can see they're very young they're very new um, this one has uh, age of one year so really small at the moment but it will grow 
further and further and then in three years when we are back in three years we're gonna see the first harvest of the same cultivar which is a complete new creation by Mr. Sakamoto. After touring the fields, Mr. Sakamoto pours a cold brewed Saimidori Gyokuro for us. This tea is made from a special tea cultivar that produces a lighter and sweeter taste. So after visiting the tea fields of Mr. Sakamoto, we finally get to drink a cold brew Gyokuro, Chameijin, and we got a Sakura Moji. This is very traditional in this time to have it and it is actually made out of rice or rice paste and there are red beans inside and covered or rolled in a sakura leaf. After the tasting, Mr. Sakamoto takes us to his favorite cherry blossom spot. The cherry blossoms that serve as a reminder of the fragility of life also serve to demonstrate the fragility of nature. Sakamoto knows that if he wants to preserve the natural beauty of his region, it begins with the love and care of his tea field. Over the years, he has become the president of the Kagoshima Organic Tea Growing Association, allowing him to teach other tea farmers his secrets so that together they can care for not only their own tea fields, but also for all of Kagoshima. Next, we would be meeting another one of Kagoshima's organic tea growers. Mr. Kawaji. Mr. Kawaji tends to a small plot of land here in Kagoshima and specializes in the production of these deep steamed teas. While most Japanese teas are steamed for around 45 seconds, Fukumushi teas can be steamed for up to twice as long. This method was developed in the 20th century as a way to make teas smoother in flavor so that they would be more palatable. During the long steaming process, the cell membranes are broken down, allowing more of the leaf to flow into the water, creating a cloudy green infusion. This makes not only the color more vibrant, but also the taste. These fukumushi style teas become more full bodied, but they also take on more of these notes of steamed vegetables and even fruit. Mr. Kawaji has been experimenting with different tea cultivars in different steaming times to create an assortment of unique tasting teas. Because his area has such mild winters, he is able to grow more exotic cultivars like Yutaka Midori and Asatsuyu. The Yutaka Midori or Abundant Green cultivar is one of the perfect teas for Fukumushi, and for that reason he uses it in his Murasaki Sencha. This tea has a powerful savory finish with notes of banana and papaya. Another cultivar he uses is the Asatsuyu. This super sweet tea cultivar is typically reserved for Gyokuro, but he took a chance and decided to produce it using the deep steaming method to create his Asatsuyu Shincha. This tea also has a full-bodied flavor with notes of sweet corn and edamame. One of our favorite things to see in the tea farmers we meet is this curiosity or passion for experimentation. Farmers like Mr. Sakamoto and Mr. Kawaji are always trying new things to see what will work, and it's been a great privilege to work with both of them over the years. For the final chapter in our journey, we will be exploring a new island known as Yakushima. Off the southern coast of Kyushu lies the beautiful subtropical island of Yakushima. Although this island is small, it's home to a diverse array of wildlife, including the sika deer and the red-bottomed macaque. The island is also host to some of the largest tracts of uninterrupted tropical evergreen forests in Japan, with some trees aging over 2,000 years old. To get to the island, we take a three-hour ferry from Kagoshima. To pass the time, Oliver will explain how to prepare green tea when you're on the go. Hi everyone, this is Oliver from Mio, and we are here on the ship to Yakushima, and um, we tried to kind of get through this time by drinking a little bit of green tea, but the problem is here we don't have a Kyushu, we don't have anything, but we only have our green tea. And now what we discovered is that actually what you have to do when you're on the, ra when you're on the road and you don't have a filter, you still can brew your tea in the teacup. But we, what you have to look is that the water is not too hot. So then actually you can get out the sweeter notes of your tea and the tea leaves, with the time, they will soak up the water and they will sink down to the bottom of the cup. So on the top, you can sip easily your tea. It doesn't get too astringent due to the fact that the water is not too hot. So if you're ever in desperation for a good green tea and you only have your green tea leaves, but you don't have a Kyushu, don't panic. You can do this type of brewing. It's not the best brewing because still you have a little bit of astringency but it is also a very good cup just to get over the time of a ride or of a waiting time outside of your own tea section. After arriving on the island, the first thing to do is rent a car so we can begin exploring the natural beauty. You like the color? I love the color. A trip to the island of Yakushima was the inspiration for Hayao Miyazaki's famous anime classic, Princess Mononoke about the struggle between the spirits of the forest and the humans that consume its resources. 
After spending just a few hours among these forests, it's easy to see how such an idea could come to Miyazaki. On Yakushima, you can really feel the full extent of nature's beauty and how imperiled it is. There is a never-ending struggle between the demands for conservation and the demands for consumption, but the people that live on this island seem to have found a compromise for the time being. Almost half of the island gets its electricity from hydroelectric power, and it's far less common to use chemical farming here than in the rest of Japan. One of these organic farmers is Mr. Watanabe. He and his family have been growing tea on this field for over 30 years, and they are proud to say that this land has been used for nothing else besides organic tea cultivation. This field is in the middle of a beautiful pine forest that benefits from the unique climate of the island. So you can really see that we are here in the Yakushima tea farm, Mr. Watanabe, that it is an organic tea farm. Already there are plants growing all around uh, the tea plants here. Uh, we have seen some wild strawberries growing also close to the plant. And what the family really does to really lift this cycle of the nature is that in the end of the year, instead of harvesting the last crop, so the last um, harvest, which is called autumn harvest or akibancha as well, um, they use it to nourish the plant again. So these final crops, they give it back to nature to really close the circle of the year, to close the circle of nature, to also really have the best tasting tea and to give the best nourishment to the plants. Organic tea cultivation is easier on the field of the Watanabe family because the heavy rainfall keeps the bugs away. Yakushima has some of the highest rainfall in all of Japan and this makes it easy to farm without the use of pesticides. The other unique aspect of this island is its temperature. Although Yakushima is located in the far south, it's still quite cold. This pushes back the tea harvest so it's more consistent with the rest of Japan. As we arrive to the tea field, they are just now starting to cover the tea plants. So we're here now uh, at the moment when they put the kabuse on the field and this tea will be covered for around uh, 10 days. And uh, as you can see, they just roll it over the tea plant. And uh, it's, very, it's a very light material, so it will not damage the plant. And then this will stay for 10 days covering and shading the plant. While 10 days of shading isn't enough to create a gyokuro or a matcha, it will just take off a little bit of the bitterness from the tea and give it a slightly smoother flavor. The Watanabe family doesn't only make green tea, but also black tea as well. At their facility, they actually process the two teas separately. Good, we're here in the Watanabe production uh, of uh, their green tea or the production facility. And what you can see here is one of their drying machines. And what's pretty interesting, what he told us is that he uses for black tea and for green tea two separate machines due to the strong flavor of the black tea which would then influence the flavor of the green tea he uses two different uh, kind of machines and what we have here down the aisle is really the drying process over several steps and uh, in the beginning they start to dry the leaves with wind so they blow a hot wind with the leaves, with the turning of the leaves, helping it really to lose fast their um, moisture. And this machine here, for example, is now the first one which functions without wind. And it's just a big brush bringing out the moisture of the leaves. For the Watanabe family, it's not enough to simply produce teas in a natural way. They also want those teas to taste natural as well. Instead of going out of their way to produce a tea that is extra sweet, for example, they pretty much leave the tea alone and allow it to taste as nature would have wanted it to, with slightly more bitterness. It's really interesting, this tea, so this is a Yutaka Midori. And actually, it is a shaded tea, but what you see is, when you drink it, you have really the sweetness first, but then it turns into a quite dry tea, so you get a little bit this tannin flavor, um, where you have a little bit of a dry sensation in your palate, and this is very specific now, uh, he said it is a plant or it is a cultivar that has a little bit more of bitterness, and you can really feel it due to the covering, the, the bitterness is brought down, but this kind of dryness stays, so this is quite uh, unique now for this tea. After exploring the farm, we pay a visit to another iconic resident of the island. A famous potter named Masayuki Yamashita moved out of the city to enjoy a more peaceful life living in the forest of Yakushima. 
Here he gathers firewood for his kiln and crafts beautiful clay teaware and other decorative pottery. He even gathers coral and sands from the beaches of Yakushima to create a natural colored glaze for his pottery without using artificial dyes. What's pretty interesting is that he has to heat the oven up to 1300 degrees. So this is material which exactly at this temperature starts to melt. And as soon as the oven is ready, this will melt and will look like this and then he knows that the oven is ready to put his clay sculptures, teapots or cups in the oven. Mr. Yamashita explains that depending on which type of pottery he is creating, it needs to be heated at a different temperature. This is achieved by arranging the unfinished clay in different parts of the kiln. They are actually all handmade and you can see that they are really different in style. And each of them is placed at a unique part, so at a different part in the oven, in the kiln. And then due to the different color, due to the different um, exposures of these cups, they end up finally with a complete different design, even by being in the same time in the oven, being the same size, being made of the same clay. In addition to tea cups, he also makes beautiful tea bowls, which can be used to prepare matcha in the tea ceremony. Due to more baking, so twice, twice the times than this one here, the clay gets much more shiny, and this is also due to the wood giving it its shiny way of being while here the shininess is there but in a very slight slight way feeling the weight of this pottery really conveys a sense of importance just as learning about tea gives us a greater appreciation for the drink learning about how tea ware is made also gives us an appreciation for all the work that goes into producing just the tea ware quality tea and tea ware doesn't have to come at the expense of the surrounding land however after a few days in yakushima we have learned how the people of this island really value and respect the land they were given yakushima is a small island but it has a lot to teach we would be soon getting on a ferry and concluding our trip through japan but we would be taking with us many valuable lessons it has been such a privilege working with so many talented farmers over the years and it really has been fun to meet with them and their families, explore the fields and taste the teas with them. It would be a great honor to share these experiences with all of you wherever you are in the world. We would greatly appreciate it if you could visit neoteas.com, try some of the teas that we have found in our travels and help us to support the men and women who have made it their life's work to produce tea in a more natural, sustainable way.